And now I'm pressing start. You're Welcome. Good. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are so excited to kick off these weekly meetings with all of you, with the entire patient community. So thank you for joining us. We're gonna be recording the webinar and post it on our website. Please feel free to share it with uh, your colleagues, friends. Uh, we really want to get the word out. And most importantly, we want to be available uh, to the entire ALS community on a weekly basis to answer any and all questions you might have about the platform trial. I'm Sabrina Paganoni and I'm, I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. Mary Sukovic, the PI of the platform trial. And I'm uh, super excited to be here with Sandy Morris from IMALS, um, who's uh, uh, an integral, in, important part of our um, patient advisory committee. And we keep learning from her. And so actually the idea of a weekly webinar came from Sandy uh, and the other patient advisors. And so we're so excited to kick off this series. And, and there's no better way to kick it off by asking Sandy to, um, to say a few words about the involvement of the patient community and the patient advocacy uh, groups in, um, in the uh, design and, and launch of the trial. Sandy, okay. is this thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Sabrina. I'm thrilled to be here. I apologize, I'm still learning to talk with the BiPAP, so uh, bear with me here, but I'm just so pleased for folks to join us and hear about the platform trial. I'm definitely hearing some concerns from people that aren't hearing back from their clinics maybe in time or hearing the answers that they're looking for. And I just really think that a weekly Q&A from the experts should be able to clear up so much of that. So I encourage everyone that's interested to be a part of this. And these will be recorded so you could go back and hear what was said if you weren't able to join at the time that was scheduled. So I could not be more excited about the first ever ALS platform trial. And I just feel like it's a real game changer and a real turning point in this disease. So I thank everybody that's been a part of it. And I super thank the people that are participating in the trial and know that you are making the difference in ALS science. And I could not be more grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. So I, I think we can start uh, with a presentation. We do have a short presentation because this is our first meeting and some people might not be familiar with the trial, but I'll try to go rapidly you know, with the few slides we have uh, and really leave most of, of the time for your questions. Next slide. Next slide, yeah, thank you. So this is the, the agenda. Again, a brief agenda, a brief review of the trial. Uh, we want to provide updates on enrollment, uh, study treatments, and sites. Uh, this is another great idea that we got from Sandy, from our patient advisory committee, and, and, and different um, advisors from the IMELS group as well. Uh, we really want to share uh, enrollment updates with all of you on a weekly basis so that you, um, you are aware exactly of where we stand with that. We also want to share some information about how to stay in touch and find a site near you. Uh, we thought we would answer uh, every every week answer one week uh, one question one frequently asked question and so for today we're focusing on exclusionary supplements and interventions also if there are questions that you think would be appropriate for these weekly webinars please send them in advance so that we can also plan slides to better explain some of the um, uh, the more detailed concepts but again we're going to leave time for your questions next slide so first of all the, the reason we are doing all of this is to accelerate the development of new treatments for ALS. That's the number one goal. That's the only goal really of this entire program. And we are fully committed. We have a team that's fully dedicated to this trial to be able to develop new treatments for ALS. Next. The way we're gonna do it is to uh, test multiple treatments at the same time. We used to, you know, in the past, the only way to test uh, new drugs was to really do it one, uh, one at a time. Uh, and that was uh, time consuming. Now with the platform trial, 
We just launched it and we're gonna keep it open for a very long time until we find treatments for all people with ALS and we will continue to add new treatments. We started with three, A, B, and C, but we are already in the process of adding D or a fourth drug. And then we will continue to uh, add treatments in the future, again, until we find uh, more and more effective treatments. Next. So these are the first three regimens or treatments, um, Zylucoplan, Verdiperstat, and CNM AU8. These are the three that we are testing at this time. Uh, as you know from past presentations, uh, the randomization ratio is three to one active to placebo, meaning that there's more chances of being on active than on placebo within each regimen. Uh, and there's for every regimen, there is an open label extension. So after the placebo control trial, which is about six months, there is an open label extension, meaning that everyone who completes that placebo control trial has the option to go on active treatment for several months. Uh, again, it's an option, uh, but certainly something important for us to offer. Uh, we selected the treatments by, um, by uh, reviewing a number of applications and specifically it was a, a team of expert ALS scientists that um, selected the first treatments to go into the platform trial that was based on a competitive process. Uh, we opened with, uh, again, regimens A, B, and C. We're adding regimen D, predopidine, uh, very soon, later this year. And we're already in discussions with three companies for 2021. Next. Enrollment updates, that's the, the real excitement here. Uh, the, the trial is up and running and we've been enrolling quite well. We, um, we had 110 individuals with ALS. Signed, uh, who signed uh, informed consent and 60 are currently on study drug. Uh, as you know, after participants sign informed consent, there is a screening process uh, and then there's sort of a, um, a two-step process to be assigned to a specific regimen or drug and then uh, begin treatment. So at this time, 60 people are receiving study drug. And again, we will continue to update the community on a weekly basis so that you will be able to follow our progress. We do have a patient navigator uh, that's a person, Catherine Small, uh, uh, who just started uh, in this role. She has a phone number and an email uh, listed uh, here. Uh, feel free to reach out anytime with any questions. In addition to the weekly webinars, uh, you can reach Catherine at any time with additional questions. Next. As you know, we want to uh, bring the trial uh, as close as possible to where people live. For that reason, we are planning on 54 sites to uh, participate in the platform trial. We have 24 sites that are already actively enrolling. We are working as hard as possible on site activation for the remaining sites, up to 54. However, we already have, uh, are making plans to add more sites. Uh, and so we will add them once the first 54 have been activated. In order to find contact information of participating sites and to also know whether they're um, enrolling or not at this time, you can go on our website and, and that's the website here um, on the slide. Next. And this is another way to receive updates uh, in addition to the webinars, the, the phone number, email, and our website, you can also sign up for a newsletter. We do send out information about uh, this trial, but also about other research opportunities on a regular basis. So if you want to sign up for what we call the ALS link, that's the website uh, on the slide. Next. Okay, so we wanted to uh, now um, take one question, again, one question that we think is important to discuss, and then we will open it up to your questions from the audience live. So first of all, the first question is, which supplements or interventions are exclusionary? As you know, uh, each trial, uh, each ALS trial has a list of different medications that might be exclusionary. So we wanted to share the guiding principles for this trial and also in general for ALS trials. So for, for this particular trial, we are excluding supplements or interventions such as medications that are in a different trial. Uh, so for example, uh, medications that are being tested in a clinical trial, in another clinical trial for ALS, as they might affect uh, our investigation. Uh, it, there could be additional supplements that might be exclusionary based on safety or specific interactions with the treatment under evaluation. Uh, so we do have a list. Uh, and we are now sharing a few um, uh, of those uh, so that we, we can discuss exactly the most commonly um, asked questions. So specifically, we have been asked whether these supplements, Tatka, uh, sodium phenylbutyrate, which is actually a medication, curcumin and methylcobalamin are exclusionary or not. So Tatka is exclusionary 
as is sodium phenylbutyrate and curcumin. For methylcobalamin, uh, that's also exclusionary, but only at very high doses. And the reason for that is because each one of these interventions is in a, in a different ALS trial. So for that reason, at this time, they're considered exclusionary. Now, if, if any of those were to be approved and would become standard of care or sort of FDA approved medications, at that point, they would become um, allowed. And again, that's more information here on the slide. So uh, this is true, not just for the uh, platform trial. Most trials have a specific list of exclusionary supplements and medications. However, each trial might have a different list. And the list also might change over time because new trials might open and other trials might end. And so we keep the, the list updated depending on what other trials are going on at that specific time. Also, if somebody participated in a trial previously, after appropriate washout, uh, they can still enroll in the platform trial. So if somebody ends uh, participation in a trial or, uh, or stops the use of some of these uh, supplements, then after appropriate washout, they can still be enrolled in the trial. So again, this is not uh, sort of forever, but it's only um, uh, until the participant takes those medications or supplements and, and then a washout period. Next slide. Couple of notes on stem cells, because that's a frequently asked question. So prior use of stem cells um, via intratecal or intravenous administration is allowed after appropriate washout. So there are some trials, obviously, of stem cells that have been given via intratecal uh, or intravenous administration. So uh, that's exclusionary as long as the participant is receiving them. But after participation in that trial has ended and there's appropriate washout, then the participant can enroll in the trial. There is a caveat there. So if stem cells were injected directly into the brain or the spinal cord, that would be exclusionary because the actual injection into the brain or into the spinal cord would change uh, sort of the structure of the brain or spinal cord um, in, in a permanent way. And so that's something that would be exclusionary um, forever, basically, for the lifetime. Um, treatment for familial ALS has similar principles, meaning that prior use of antisense oligonucleotides, which are medications, is allowed after appropriate washout. So if somebody participates in a trial, for example, of an antisense oligonucleotide, uh, they cannot enroll in the platform trial at the same time, but they can wash out after the other trial has ended and then enter the platform trial. The caveat is that gene therapy introduced by viral vectors that's gonna be exclusionary forever because those viral vectors will integrate into the brain or spinal cord and cause a, sort of a permanent change. And for that reason, it will be exclusionary. Next slide. This slide is a little bit busy and that, that gives detailed um, examples of interventions that are allowed within certain dosing limits. I know it's a lot. Uh, I'm just going to put up the slide there. This basically tells you that there's an, another list of, um, of supplements that um, are allowed up to a certain dose. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just going to put them on the slide and see if people have questions. Um, and, and again, the reason is because some of these higher doses uh, are being tried in, in trials for ALS. I know it's a lot of details, but we just wanted to explain the process and the principles and why certain medications or supplements are allowed while others are, might not um, be allowed. So that was it for the presentation. And now I, really what we want you to do is to leave as much time as possible for your questions. Great, we already have um, uh, about 10 questions and we had a few that came in earlier. So we'll go through them rapid fire, but please yes. write that in any other uh, questions that you have. Um, one question I think I can answer just quickly is whether we're still recruiting. And yes, absolutely. We really just just started and it is a perpetual trial, meaning that um, you know, we're gonna keep adding new drugs. So it's not, we're not gonna run out of spots in, in, in that sense. So it's definitely open. Um, there's a question, does the patient navigator help with trial enrollment issues only? And it's great if you want to answer that. They can also uh, answer general questions about the trial. Uh, and if you have questions about, um, you know, the, the trial design or, or again, uh, exclusionary medications, the things that we just reviewed, feel free to, to call the navigator. 
Another question. Um, can you explain the second screening in a little more detail after the master protocol screening a uh, relative of the person writing had, has done the master protocol screening is waiting to hear about the next steps. Um, and the coordinator said something about if he didn't meet the criteria for one regimen, he could be assigned to another. Is that true? Yeah, so that's exactly, you know, that's one of the great efficiencies of the platform trial approach. So essentially, if somebody is screened for the master protocol, that's sort of the first step for getting into the trial. At that point, the participant will be assigned to any of the available regimens. Now, it might be that one regimen might not be a good fit for that particular participant because, for example, uh, of past medical history or some interaction with the drug or some allergies. If that's the case, then the participant could be immediately reassigned to another uh, regimen that's available at that site. And, and in, in other words, you could be immediately assigned to a different regimen without having to go through the whole uh, screening process. Now, obviously, all of this depends on the specifics, so I, I don't know the specific situation, but just wanted to point out that this system creates efficiencies so that people can find uh, their best match, basically, yeah. uh, if they fail the first. Um, it's regiment. a really nice feature of it. It actually happened already once in a site, and it was nice that the site could that day re-randomize that person to another arm. Um, so that, that's fantastic. Um, there's a question. I'm in Tennessee. I've asked my neurologist in Vanderbilt about the platform trial in September. He said it got delayed at Vanderbilt because of COVID. When are they going to be available? If not, how do I enroll in another state? That's a great question. So unfortunately, as, as you all know, COVID um, had a, a you know, very different geographic impact. So it happened at different times in different places and also different institutions might have had different issues depending uh, on the specifics of the situation. So, uh, so I would say that certainly we're working hard on activating all the sites as soon as possible. We also recognize that some sites really, uh, you know, they, there have been sites uh, and I don't know this, this uh, you know, in, I'm not referring to this in, in, in particular, but you know, there's been a lot of uh, organizational challenges at the different institutions. And so, uh, so I think I, I, I cannot answer specifically when this site will be activated. I would have to look it up. Uh, I can tell you that all sites are uh, making a lot of progress and working hard within the constraints that are very significant actually. Yes. So our, our, our hope again is the platform navigator will be able to get more specifics. They might be able to tell you, is it like a week away or is it a couple weeks away? Um, and we'll have that uh, data at their fingertips um, to, to help. Um, you also, um, they also asked whether they could go in another state. And yes, people can go in, enroll in another state, but we are asking people to stay uh, wherever they enroll to do the whole study there. So it has to be a place that's you know, close, reasonably close enough that it's, it's you know, feasible for someone to, to go to that center for all the visits. Um, but there's no, um, you know, state line that you can't go in another state. But hopefully we'll get uh, Vanderbilt up and, and running. You know, once the nice thing is once all 54 are, are set, then they're set for, for all, the, all the drugs. So it, it, it's this interim beginning part where we don't have all of them, but but we're hoping to have everybody soon. And, and I do want to say we're actually going to be adding more sites in the 54. Um, we'll be issuing a call for interested sites in November to join additional ones. And we're going to try to cover some of the geographies that, are, that we're not covering well yet. Now, it does take a couple months to add a new site, but we, we, uh, we have heard that there's, there's need to have more sites in other geographies. Um, there's a question about will there be interim analyses for each arm? Yes, we do have interim analysis um, for each arm uh, to see if a drug is not effective. So if the drug is not effective, uh, the arm will be stopped. So this is a, a question unrelated to the platform trial, but uh, the, the expert is uh, on the Zoom. So uh, is there an update on the availability of AMX0035? No update at this time. Uh, I can tell you that there's a lot of active discussions in terms of what's next, uh, and I will be happy to keep you posted as soon as those decisions are made. Um, question, is Kirk Kerman the same as Tumor? Uh, yes, uh, it is. Uh, so I just, uh, I just want to point out that if, if you're using this as a, as a, as a flavor uh, for food, that will be allowed if it's part of sort of diet or cuisine. Uh, but if it's taken as a supplement, meaning as a pill, um, that would be exclusionary. And the reason being is that uh, there is a trial, there is an ongoing trial uh, of curcumin 
um, uh, at the dif different hospitals in the U.S. Thank you. Uh, this is a question, are there therapies that are considered exclusionary? And uh, I, I know you have a slide up with some of them, but go ahead. Yeah, maybe if you can go back a couple of slides. Um, it's, uh, yes, there are a few therapies that are considered exclusionary, but only the ones that are experimental. So any, any therapy that you, uh, people are taking for symptoms or that are FDA approved, anything that's FDA approved is allowed. The only therapies that are uh, excluded are the ones that are being tested in a different clinical trial. Yeah, for example, there's there's a you know there's going to be a, a phase three trial of abutilast, so that would be exclusionary because that's in a trial. There's also going to be one of a drug called mesitinib, so same that would be exclusionary. Um, and that, this isn't unique for the platform trial. This is every trial and every disease. Um, you know, doesn't. Um, I let people be on more than one experimental drug at a time because then it becomes impossible to tell if the, if the treatment is effective or not, uh, and also for safety reasons. So related to that, there's a question about whether uh, participation in neuron uh, would be exclusionary. So the, the stem cells in the neuron trial were given via intratecal administration, meaning in the spinal fluid, and that's what's on the slide right now. So prior use of stem cells via, via intratecal administration, such as neuron, is allowed after appropriate washout, basically a month after. And I wanna say that we're one of the only trials to allow that. We felt very strongly that those cells are probably not there forever. And we, we know that um, you know, based on the first study. Um, and so we didn't wanna exclude people, uh, but there are other phase three trials by other sponsors where they, any use of a stem cell is exclusionary. So each, each trial is different, but we, again, we tried to be as open as we could. Um, the question, once the platform participant finishes, I see that there's an open label extension or option to try another regimen. Uh, what if you're past the 36 months of symptom onset at this point, can you still go into another regimen? So you're correct that after somebody finishes participation in the six months uh, of placebo control trial, they can decide to go into the open label extension. Uh, they, that's not mandatory, but they can uh, also uh, try to screen again for the trial and try a different regimen. However, they would have to be to still be eligible for the platform trial. Uh, so if somebody is no longer eligible for the platform trial, that would not be an option to try a different regimen. However, they do have the option to continue on the open label extension. Okay. Um. Uh, is the trial the same at each participating facility or do different places have different focus or different screening criteria? Yeah, that's the same. So uh, the same regimens are available at all sites. So uh, really it doesn't matter where you enroll, the trial will be the same. There's a particular question about SUNY, whether they're, um, have they started recruiting? I can answer that, that no, they're, they're not activated yet, but they are working uh, very hard to, to get there. And uh, again, hopefully soon. Um, there's a kind of question back to curcumin. So curcumin as food is allowed. There's just a confirmation about that. Yeah, as food, yes. Great. Um, someone wants to know if we can um, provide the copy of the slides. Maybe you can we can post where, them. Uh, yeah. Did. Yeah, absolutely. We can post that. We will post the video and we can post uh, the slides as well. And when you say post, where where should people look for those? You're right. Uh, it should be on our website. And maybe uh, if we can go to one of the slides where our website is indicated so that it's easier for people to find it. Uh, the one before, yeah. You can go on that website and um, in, in one of the web pages, uh, we're gonna post that. There's a per, for patient uh, tab where it's easy to find all of this information, all the recordings from the previous trial, uh, previous webinars, as well as the future ones. There's a question, can you give an update on the expanded access program? I'm happy to maybe take that one. Uh, so we're, uh, we're really excited to build this as a parallel program uh, to the platform trial and actually going forward, making it part of our contracting with companies that they provide drug for a parallel par uh, expanded access program. We are now uh, fundraising for this. We have a grant uh, pending with an organization that I, I see is, is on the line. So we're waiting to hear if we got that grant and that, that would be matched by the company and that would allow us to get going really fast. Uh, and we have uh, two other companies that have agreed and uh, we're really just designing the protocol now and, and, and raising the funds for it, but we're determined to do it. My best guess, we're talking end of the year, early 2021, but it's gonna depend on, um, 
on kind of getting the grants and, and the funding and and uh, the FDA approvals. But we're we got a team working on it, and uh, it's going to be something that's just going to be part of the, the platform trial, with, you know, all this going forward. Um, the only other thing I'd say to that is expanded. These type of expanded accesses are small. So when the drug is in the phase that they are for platform trials, often companies can give it for 20 or 30 patients. The big expanded access programs are later after a drug, for example, has a positive phase three, uh, then sometimes companies will do like a thousand patient expanded access or a larger one while they're waiting for FDA approval of their, of their drug. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're determined to get it, get it off the ground. Um, a study, once one of the drugs or placebo is being taken, approximately how long would you expect for it to show results? So, so in order for us to test whether the drug works or not, we need to wait for all the participants to have completed the six months of, of, of treatment. So essentially, uh, if it takes us, let's say, nine months to enroll everyone, for example, plus six months, at the end of that, we will know if the drug works or not. That's probably the minimum time you need. I mean, again, in trials in ALS used to be 12 months, 18 months, nine months. We really pushed to be able to um, be able to figure it out in a short, yep. short amount of time. But once you get shorter than that, it, you're not actually giving the drug enough time to, to have an, uh, an effect. A um, couple quick uh, things, a question about websites listing participating sites. I think you're, it's right um, on, the, on the slide now. And we keep this updated anytime a site is, is activated, we, we add it to this site. Um, and again, with, with the, um, the navigator is going to have more uh, granular detail on how close some of the sites are to activation. Um, and we're excited to have that new role. Um, question, is it true to participate in the platform trial have to be evaluated in person, in my case, Ohio State? Yes, the screening visit is in person. So uh, that would require uh, an in-person visit at the site. Yeah, and I'm happy to say Ohio is open and enrolling. So that's, uh, that's good news. Um, there's a question, how long does the process take to start the trial after being approved? Would there be time to have a washout after I know we're approved? Um, for IE Talka. So the, the washout should actually happen before screening. So I would encourage you to discuss the list of medications with your physician and wash out before the screening. So the 30 days are before uh, the screening visit. Then after that, um, you know, after the screening, sort of initiation of the treatment is, is, you know, is fairly rapid. So the question, who do I contact for more trial details in Massachusetts? And I can maybe answer that because there's two sites right now open in Massachusetts, Mass General Hospital and UMass, UMass just opened. Um, so depending where, where you live, you could contact either of those sites and their contact information is actually on the same link here that you see on the slide. Um, all the site uh, contact information is there. Um, is there a diagnosis timing limitation? Meaning if I was diagnosed a few years ago, am I still qualified? Yes, the, the limitation is three years from onset. Uh, that's actually more, um, more permissive than other trials. And this was discussed after a lot of um, calculations and statistical simulations to make sure that we would give access to people as much as possible, but we would also retain the statistical power to be able if a drug is effective or not. Uh, and this allows us to uh, keep the trial relatively small and, and fast uh, so that we can get an answer as quickly as possible. And we expect that the answer will then be applicable to everyone, even those who are not eligible to participate. For the possibility of enrolling out of state, how many in-person visits are typical during a trial? So typically uh, it's five or six visits in person. We did add in some flexibility for remote visits if needed because of a pandemic. However, um, you know, because of COVID, however, I would say that it, it's, it's much easier if you, uh, if you can enroll at a site um, nearby so that there's not too much travel involved to limit exposure. Yeah. My daughter lives in Connecticut. One of the sites listed is Hospital for Special Care. When can we enroll her there? We contacted them and they pointed us to these webinars. 
Yeah, I think every, you know, the enrollment at each specific site depends essentially on, on, on how many patients are con contacting that particular site and are eligible. So it's really a uh, so discussion with, uh, with that site to see uh, how many people they have in their clinic who are interested in participating. So I would say that we are at the time now where we're experiencing tremendous interest, which is great. We're very excited about this trial and we really want to enroll uh, people as quickly as possible. It does create a new challenge uh, that we really need to uh, scale up also sort of availability and resources at the sites and also open more sites. Again, we will uh, open more sites uh, after the first 54. Yeah, so this is the challenge. And, and uh, the last thing we want is for patients not to get uh, called back. So th th they should definitely be calling you back. Um, if I think uh, if, if we'll send out these slides, but please contact the patient navigator and we'll try to help find out if they have room there or if there's another site. I think Connecticut stuff and New York is de are definitely areas we've realized we need to have more sites at because uh, they're, they're telling us they're at capacity of what they can do safely there now. Um, but we, we, we don't want anyone turned away. So please contact the patient navigator and we'll try to find the close, you know, the close options for, for your daughter. Uh, so there's another kind of related question. I'm on the waiting list for a couple of the Healy platform trial sites that are not active yet. When will I no be notified if I'm selected or rejected for the trial? Now, just before you answer that question, I'll say we have a really good suggestion from one of our um, patient advisors who's asked if we can use these sessions to announce which sites are active. Great. Yeah, so I uh, will definitely do that, uh, announce the sites, uh, and then I would encourage you to contact the sites again, um, you know, periodically uh, to get updates. Uh, again, we will announce which sites are up and running. The patient navigator is also there for you uh, to answer any questions. So, um, yes, so feel free to, to reach out to the patient navigator as well. Yeah. So there's a question. Thank you very much for this session. What's the structure of the visit? So the, does the participant come weekly, monthly? Yeah, this is a great question. So they come in uh, more often in the beginning and then a little bit um, less frequently later on. Uh, so initially it's essentially every four weeks and then it goes to every eight weeks. So it's uh, a couple of screening visits in the baseline, then week four, eight, 16, and 24. Yes. There's two questions around the expanded access. One is um, whether it's gonna be at multiple sites or only at MGH and then a very kind offer about how we can help uh, fundraise for it. So our, our goal, our long-term goal is that it's gonna be at all the centers where we're gonna start at um, three and then we'll go up to 10 and we'll try to, try to build it um, as fast as we can. Um, any help with fundraising is really appreciated and you can either contact myself or we have some information on, on our website, but thank you. But our, our, the, the vision is to have all centers. So it, basically if someone comes to center and they're eligible for the platform trial and they wanna do it, they go in there. If they're not eligible, there's an expanded access option for them. That, that's the, the big vision. Uh, we, just, we just have to build it and build it as fast as we can. Uh, any update on Dr. Appel's T-Reg study? The study is still ongoing, so uh, certainly uh, it, we look forward to the results over the next few months, but uh, the participants are still in the trial, so we don't have final results. Oh, someone said that the, uh, the link uh, that we're showing is going to page not found. Oh. That's I will check those. Yeah, I had to say that the easiest way to also find it is if you just go on Google Healy Center for ALS. That's the first uh, web page that you, you, you will find. So the Healy Center, and within that uh, web page, it's very easy to find the platform trial. All right. But we'll check our link for the next uh, before we post uh, the slides. We'll update yeah. that. Um, is being a Green Bay Packer fan is very. <laughs> I love that. I mean, one of my sons, believe it or not, is a Green Bay uh, Packer fan, so definitely no, it's not exclusionary. <laughs> Neither uh, Chicago Bears, that's, that's allowed as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so will data collected like labs be available to our neurologist? Uh, if needed for clinical care, uh, you know, your team can discuss that with your neurologist. But yes, they should be able to get it. Yeah. Um, is there any way uh, possible that I can somehow pre-enroll for the expanded access program? We're not, um, you know, because we're just building it now, we're not like taking lists, but I think again, if, if you can, um, you can either reach out to us and, tell, and we can connect with your neurologist and, and uh, try to make sure that they're one of the sites to, you know, that expresses interest. Um, 
and we'll keep this group up to date. Uh, we'll make sure that's always updates on where we are on the EAP program. How long do you anticipate until all 54 sites are up and running? Yeah, I mean, the, the expectation is that they will be up and running very soon. Uh, again, that there might be, sometimes it's administrative steps uh, at the different sites that might um, really prevent the very final steps for activation. I, would, I want to say that the activation is actually a multi-step process that involves many different departments within every institution, um, you know, from legal to contracts to uh, all the administrative sp steps. And sometimes it's just the last step that's just, you know, what's uh, really slowing this down. Um, so hopefully, again, all, everyone is really uh, working on, on all of these and hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, have them up and running um, over the next few weeks. There's a particular question about Columbia, how close they are. They are very close. We're expecting them this week or next week. And since this week is almost over, it's like it'll be next week. But them, them I know. And, and they are our only site in New York. So we realize we have to add another site in New York. Even with a lot of people moving out of New York, there's still a lot of people there. Um, could someone out of the country enroll if they're willing to travel to screening visits and in-person visits? Yes, in theory, they, they are uh, uh, they could enroll. Uh, now, the, the challenge with, with the pandemic uh, is, first of all, travel. Obviously, the, the big challenge is also border closures. Um, you know, for, for many countries, you know, for many countries, it's now not possible to get a visa uh, or cross the border. So it's really outside of our control. But in theory, they could uh, participate. In the past, we did have international patients for other trials, but again, unfortunately, there are some significant restrictions at this time. So thank you. Um, so uh, uh, you'll see if, I don't know if everyone can see it, but what, what's missing on our website link is a dash sites at the end. <laughs> thank you. Um, is Emory University in Georgia open for enrollment? And I can maybe answer that one. And no, they're not, but they, they will be eventually. They, they, they are probably going to be one of the later sites. Um, so again, they, each site has different particular things for them. It's, uh, um, it's really, they have a particular review process for any apps that's that takes much longer than other places so that um but there there again the team is trying to go as fast as they can um and i realize they're our only site in georgia um there's a question of uh about what trial we're referring to for someone who, who joined late this is for the healy als platform trial um okay we're almost done let's see um There's a question, please share the best place to donate money to from local fundraisers other than ALSA. <laughs> so that's a big, big question. You know, there's a lot of really good groups. Uh, IMALS is one, they're, they're on the line here. Um, obviously we're trying to fundraise for the, um, for the EAP program as well as continued platform trial, Muscular Dystrophy Association. Um, there's a lot of care groups also that, that um, provide direct care to patients. So. A lot, of, a lot of really good places. Um, what's the average Healy platform trial duration? So for every participant uh, for the placebo controlled trial, the, that would be six months. And then there's a longer open label extension. If you're asking about the time it takes to complete a regimen and really test if a drug is effective or not, as I said earlier, that depends a little bit on the speed of the enrollment, but essentially if it takes, let's say nine to 12 months to enroll, all the, all the participants in a regimen, then we need to follow them for another six months until the last one is complete. And then we will be able to tell if the drug works or not. There's a question of whether the travel stipend can be donated back to MGH. Thank you for the person who said that. Yeah, yeah, you do not have to take it. It's, it's there for the sites to, to offer to patients if needed, but if people don't want it, they don't, they don't have to take it. And then it goes back into the, the pot for the bigger platform trial. Thank you. Um, will Houston be one of the three EAPs? Um, so the, the three that I was mentioning were in the grant that we submitted um, and that we're waiting for the review form. And for those three sites, um, it was uh, Duke, Northwestern, and Mass General. But uh, we're hoping to follow that soon with the expansion to 10. And I am absolutely sure that Dr. Appel and his team uh, will will want to be one of those 10 uh, first sites. But we're going to we're going to make it, you know, an option for sites and have them apply. And of course, we, we're going to try to spread it out geographically. And that long again, long term goals, everybody's going to be uh, part of it. A further question to drug selection for the trial, what type of aspects are used in the competitive selection? 
That's a great question. So first of all, there is a therapy evaluation committee that includes several ALS uh, experts and scientists that review uh, sort of the package to see, uh, you know, to review both the preclinical or uh, basic science rationale of the drug, as well as previous experience uh, in people. In other words, you want the drug to have had some uh, promising uh, results in the lab, uh, but also you want some previous experience in humans that tells us that we know the dose range or the engagement of their target that, you know, and we know a little bit more about the safety because this is a large scale trial. So we really want to get uh, to take drugs that are very promising scientifically and that we know a little bit more about in terms of how they behave in people in terms of safety and, and ability to engage their target, meaning to affect uh, the, the cellular mechanisms that they are intended to affect. Great. But we have 52 questions. So this, this tells wow. us how much uh, there's such a need for this. I'm, I'm really thankful for Sandy and the other patient advisors for recommending this. And uh, stay tuned for uh, next week. We'll post this with a corrected uh, web link. Um, yeah. And come back next week. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you.